Hello. Happy New Year. We're here in San Francisco. Do not believe anything you hear that is pouring. It's a beautiful day out there. We're actually here in GU ASCO, and we've been through a fabulous new day of presentations in prostate cancer development that brought us some very exciting news from what was called today the brute force of clinical trialsmanship, uh, Stampede. We heard some very, to me at least, I know you were more excited about the docetaxel data, but hearing this data about Selexisib today actually intrigued me a lot. And I have with me Nick James, who's the man of the year, 2015, and it looks like 2016 as well, with all this new data, who will tell us more about it. Starting from the beginning, what inspired you to create Stampede? So when we set this trial up, new agents were starting to appear in CRPC. So zoledronic acid had just been licensed. Docetaxel was in late stage phase three. It looked active from our impressions of it. And when we looked around at uh, trials, they were all ha happening in what was then called hormone refractory prostate cancer. And we thought, well, in most settings in oncology, you get a bigger gain if you do things earlier. So we thought, right, we'll do a trial in hormone sensitive prostate cancer. And then they had the, cost, the question of what agents to put in. So zoledronic acid was a no brainer, that was already licensed for CRPC. Docetax looked like it'd be licensed. But we figured there were enough patients around to put another drug and maybe a couple of combinations in as well. Now, the reason we wanted to do this is if you look at most phase three trials, only one in three comes up positive. So we thought if we have multiple arms, we've got more chances to win, basically. So it's so that's the multi-arm. But then having set off on a multi-arm trial, you don't want to put thousands of patients into something that looks not very exciting. So we also had the multi-stage thing. So that was the, the genesis of the multi-arm, multi-stage thing. And then we, we looked around and we, we sort of shopped around for a third agent to put in. And the data on non-steroidals actually looked quite compelling. It was quite a big protective effect in epidemiological studies. There was quite plausible biology underlying it. So we thought we'll put that in as the third drug. Pfizer duly obliged and provided the drug for us. And um, we still thought there were enough patients to look at some combinations as well. So with the combinations, we were in essence looking because all the drugs were from different classes, we figured that the effects, if you saw effects, would add at the very least. We weren't necessarily postulating synergy, but we were expecting at least add additivity because they were from different classes. But then you dropped it. Yes, so the multi... I mean, I didn't know that until you said it last year in the yeah. ASCO. So, so the, the, the multi stage thing, has, it's like a high jump contest. The barrier to stay in gets higher. So actually, Celecoxib got through two rounds of the high jump contest, if you like. It failed at the third round. And so the hazard ratio on failure-free survival was less than one, but just not enough less than one to carry on recruiting. And in fact, what we've seen today is that the weak failure-free survival effect did carry on and it was most pronounced, in fact there was quite, there was a heterogeneity of effect, it carried on into the, um, in the metastatic setting, that the hazard ratio was quite significantly less than one, it was less than 0.9. And um, actually for the zoledronic acid, although we formally reported that as a negative arm um, in the paper we just wrote, the hazard ratio for zoledronic acid is also less than one. So what we think we saw today was that if you add two moderate weak effects together, you actually see a significant effect. So the failure-free survival in the combination of celecoxib and zoledronic acid arm was significant, hazard ratio of 0.77, and that translated through into a survival advantage of the same amount, 0.78 in fact. But there's probably also some biology there, yeah. because we've tried similar agents yeah. in combination with docetaxel and we failed. Yeah, so that, so that that is true. None of the docetaxel combination trials have come up positive. Disastrous. And and interestingly, we didn't add celecoxib to docetaxel, which is now a shame in hindsight, because that might have been very interesting. So we've, we the, we're busy scratching our heads about what's happening here in the biology, and also statistically, we still haven't bottomed out. We need more data as to whether there's an, just an additive effect or whether there's actually genuine syn synergy between the two drugs. So what are you going to do with this celecoxib? What, what uh, Oliver said today is that yeah. probably it's like a hot potato. Yeah. Nobody wants to pick it up in the U.S. I think we're exaggerating here. Yeah. I mean, if there's a signal there. Well, well, there's a couple of things we're going to do. We want to dredge into the data a bit more precisely. So, for example, the bone subsets, which is about half the patients in the trial, 
you may postulate there'd be a bigger effect because that's where zoledronic acid mostly works. Mm -hmm. We haven't looked at that data yet. And then the second thing is, is to try, we're, we're busy trawling across the literature to see if there are pathways that we hadn't thought about that might be affected by these drugs. And I have to say, if I was running a pharmaceutical company, I'd be busy going through my library of rejected compounds to see... Or trying to reach uh, the stampede uh, investigators. Uh, yeah, and trying to see. And we're going to pull the blocks out as well and see if... So, for example, in the colorectal trials, there's quite a strong suggestion that the patients who overexpress COX-2 see a benefit from COX-2 inhibitors, although those trials were canned because of cardiovascular problems. Um, so we will, of course, we're putting the blocks out, we'll stain them for COX-2. So, that is so in, how that are is you progress. going to prove Oliver wrong, that you're not a brute force yeah. and that you're actually leading precise medicine? So we've prospectively consented all of the patients for tissue collection from the paraffin archive and we've collected DNA, germline DNA from the majority of the patients in the trial. We're recollecting it with salivary DNA because the initial collection uh, didn't work so well from a technical point of view. So we will, we are doing already some DNA studies. Ros Eels is, is heading up those for us. We've got a big grant application in at the moment to pull out as many as we can of the 8,000 odd pet blocks from the patients in the trial. So that obviously gives us a fantastic resource. From the data that Ros has looked at already, it looks like the, p the percentage with a sort of brachinous phenotype in the, going into the trial is quite high, much higher than the general population. We're already working up the feasibility of adding a PARP inhibitor arm for the patients with a brachinous phenotype. And uh, we've worked out the statistical models that we need to make that work. So we've, got, we've done the stats theory, we're doing the, putting out the blocks, we're staining them for the BRCA phenotype genes that were in Johans and others' presentation this morning. We're moving that way. And, and you're posting job applications for <laughs> investigators like me to come over, I think. We're more than happy to <laughs> collaborate with anybody that wants to work with us. We're delighted to work it's, with It's everybody. wonderful yes. work. I'm really... Yeah really uh, not only impressed, I'm just glad that it's happening at yeah. this time and I think within a few years yeah. you will be leading the way into precision as well. I hope so. I hope so. That's the, we, I'm we think, sure you are. We think, not we think, just hope. Yeah. The model is fantastic and it's, so, it's been so fantastically supported by all the UK investigators, both the oncologists and the urologists have just bought the model and it's just a default thing for patients with advanced prostate cancer. They go into stampede across the whole of the UK. So it, it's just a very effective way of, of, of answering questions. I've had the opportunity to come twice to your country uh, this year, and I yeah. was impressed by almost yeah. the fanaticism by which investigators yeah. participate yeah. in the trial. Yeah. It's really a dedication yeah. to the cause to actually make prostate yeah. cancer, yeah. in this case, history. Yeah, well, we, yeah, yeah, obviously it's recruited a fantastic number of patients and we'll be back next year with data from the Aberatron arm, which is just under 2,000 men recruited out two years ago. Um, the radiotherapy in M1 disease, uh, radiating the primary, we may well have mature survival data for that next year as well. And we've got a sub-question within that around fractionation between a conventional fractionation and a fraction a week at six grade per fraction, hypofractionated as well. So we've, we've got a whole We've got a lot of data coming out next year. And then a couple of years after that, we've got the Abrata and Enzalutamide combination on data maturing as well. So we've just got fantastic. Uh, Looking forward yes. to it. Yes. It's like sequels. Yeah, it is. So yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for joining me to discuss right. your data. Thank you all very much for joining us.